I grew up at a time of countercultural change, it was called. It was, I was in high school during a lot of the tumult of the 60s, going into college in the 70s, and there was a change in the air, fundamental earthquake change. There was the anti-war protests against the Vietnam War. There was the sexual revolution. There was the musical explosion of genius, the Beatles, Bob Dylan, so forth. There was just change in the air. There was a sense that there was an old order that needed to be overthrown and a new generation was coming forth. It was happening. But then people who were central to that revolutionary fervor were shot and killed in front of our eyes. We were young, and Bobby Kennedy, um, Martin Luther King, who looking back were young, but they weren't as young as we were, were holding aloft the dreams of a generation. When they were killed, those assassinations in some very significant way psychically struck all of us. It was so obviously a warning that was meant for each and every one of us. And just in case we hadn't gotten the message, they then killed uh, students at Kent State University who were protesting the war. So I think an entire generation was traumatized by those events, and we got the message. And the message was, there will be no further protest. <clears throat> you can go back into your lives in the private sector, do whatever you want there. And if you make a lot of money, that's good too. But leave the public sector alone. Leave it to whoever it is. Nobody could really tell you who it was. But whoever it is that wants to control the public sector so bad, you leave the public sector to them, and no one needed to say, oh, we might kill you too. Everybody got the message. And an entire generation stepped back. Now, not only did we step back, from a lot of more public display of our passions and our passion for change. But there was also this very strange split that was not there before. For instance, when I was in college, I remember we would read Ram Dass in the morning, we would read uh, Alan Watts, and then in the afternoon, we would go to Vietnam War you know, protests. There wasn't this division between the spiritual change and the political change. It was much more holistic at that time, the sense that everything was changing and everything. We, we, we went to intersectionality before the word intersectionality came around. After the assassinations, when everything began to just sort of quiet down, there seemed to be a split between those who were thinking, you know what, the only way to change things is through inner practice, inner change spiritual change, transformational change, psychological change, and almost looked askance at people who were trying to change things on the level of politics because it had been so clear to us something deeper was awry here. The other, but on the other side, there were people who doubled down, wanted to go into politics and trans, you know, transactional change, and seemed to not know what are those people doing out in places like California. It's kind of a a joke to say it, but it's not completely untrue. The transactional political types took the East Coast and the more transformational spiritual types took the West Coast. They were, they were headquartered in the two different places in the country. Now for me, I sort of never got the memo that we were supposed to stop. Because what happened was that around the time that everybody was saying, okay, I can't be a flower child forever. I'm gonna go get a job in corporate America and just become one of them. Really, that's what the seduction basically was. I sort of never stopped the, never, I, well, like I said, I never got the memo. And I started lecturing on A Course in Miracles. And my path just took me in an interesting play, in an interesting direction. I was in my 20s, I had left school in my junior year. I told my parents I would come back, but then I would just take classes at different universities and I went to live in a geodesic dome in, in, in New Mexico and I just had a lot of experiences. My parents were like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Oh, I'll go back to school, mommy and daddy, I promise. But what I really wanted to do was 
read metaphysical books. Now, I was always really interested, whether it was Eastern or Western, never mattered to me. You can put St. Thomas Aquinas, and I'm fascinated, or St. Augustine or Heidegger in front of me, and I'm fascinated. You could also put the Tao Te Ching and uh, the Bhagavad Gita and uh, Carl Jung in front of me, and I'm fascinated by that. Anything that has to do with a higher mind. Once again, the division between the kind of exoteric and esoteric religious and spiritual traditions I, I've always recognized these universal threads. And even though people like my parents were saying, yeah, but how are you going to make a living? I was like, well, I'm a temporary secretary, Mom. I'm, I'm doing okay. You can't be that forever, I was told. And when I was in my 20s, I picked up a set of books on a, on a coffee table at a party in New York City. And it said A Course in Miracles, intriguing title. And I picked it up. And I opened it up, and the, in the introduction it said, this is a Course in Miracles, it is a required course. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum, only that you can take what you want at any given time or any given part of it at any given time. And that is so strange. What book says it's a required course? And then I looked back to the front of it, and there was no author mentioned. It was just such an intriguing material. Then I continued to read, and I saw all this Christian terminology. I'm Jewish. And I had read a lot, when I was in school, I studied comparative religion and philosophy. So I had read a lot of uh, Christian uh, theologians and was fascinated. But somehow this was my personal life, so I thought, you know, I didn't know what it was, you know, I thought it was some Christian tome. But I never forgot it. And I remember that the, the man whose house it was, the young man whose house we were at, said to me, and to my boyfriend who was with me at the time, um, said, the book is published, if you ever want it, it's published out of an apartment, the Beresford Apartment Building on Central Park West, and I think 79th in, in New York City. So that was that, and then Jeff and I went home, and I don't remember ever having any conversation about it again. I don't remember him and me talking about it. Meanwhile, a year later, I'm on a bus, and during that year, I remember, because I would ride the bus to and from work in, in New York. I was doing secretarial work and so forth. And I was riding on the bus, and sometimes I would see somebody reading The Course in Miracles. I went, wow. And one time I saw an ex-boyfriend of an old roommate of mine, and she hadn't gotten along with him, and I thought it was so interesting. I didn't say anything to him. He didn't see me, but I noticed it. So about a year after that party, I was on the bus on um, Central Park West in New York and I was going to a doctor. And during those years when I lived in New York City, every year I got bronchitis. And I was so tired of the bronchitis and for whatever reason, going to the doctor again, riding on Central Park West, passing that apartment, because I'd never forgotten that they said, well, they're published out of the Beresford apartment building. I said to myself, I'm gonna get that book. I don't know why, I just thought to myself, I'm gonna get that book now. I went to the doctor, went back to my apartment, my boyfriend opened the door, we, I looked at the dining room table, and there was the Course in Miracles. I looked up at him like, I, I was shocked. And he said to me, I thought it was time. And then the next day, so I was all excited, and I told him, I, I, I was thinking about it today. He said, I thought it was time. We walk, the next day I thought, this is so incredible, and it was in three books. There's a text, and then there's a workbook, and there's something called the Manual for Teachers. So we said it would be really cool if each of us had a copy. So he had bought them at a bookstore on West 72nd Street in New York City. We walked over to the bookstore, and we walked to the shelf where he had gotten them. And they weren't there, so we said, okay, we'll ask at the cash register if um, they have another copy. And we went up to the cash register. At that time, I think it was still little like card index cards or something. I don't know, old fashioned cash registers. And he asked, and they said, Well, let's look it up. And then they said, I'm sorry, we've never had that book here. So we, like, I think at this point, millions of people probably, have interesting stories about how we found A Course in Miracles. Some people have said things to me like, my mother was on the operating table, we were waiting in the waiting room, somebody had it. These interesting ways that, that the book finds its way. You know, no path has a monopoly on truth. I believe there's one truth spoken in many different ways. And the Course doesn't claim any monopoly on truth. It's a one statement of universal spiritual themes. 
but if it's for you, you know it. And when I started reading it, even though I saw the Christian terms, it becomes clear very quickly. These terms are being used in very non, um, non-religious, um, psychotherapeutically uh, oriented terms. And uh, the Course in Miracles says it calls to all religions and no religions. Um, I've known people, you know, your, your religious identity is, is a separate issue. In fact, for myself as a Jew, I never felt that it was calling me away from my religion. As a matter of fact, it made me feel, has made me feel a deeper understanding of the mystical core of all the great religious systems, including, uh, including Judaism, you know, because the Course says it's based on universal spiritual themes. So that became my passion. But there wasn't a career doing anything with that in those days. I remember the first day that I had gone over to that apartment on Central Park West and I was just so enamored and I was saying, I'd love to volunteer if I could do anything. And Judith Scotch, who was the publisher of the book, was leaving. I remember looking at her as she got into the elevator and she was leaving to go to Houston, which is my hometown, uh, born and raised, and she was going to talk about The Course in Miracles and I remember thinking, wow, what a thing to be able to do with your life, that you just go, go around and talking about The Course in Miracles. And then when I ended up living in Houston and I would give these Course in Miracles lectures at my bookstore. Now remember, or these little study groups, remember there, there was no career niche like there is now of people who are nomina- non-denominational, spiritual, coaches or anything like that. Nothing like that even existed, so there was nothing for me to be ambitious for. And then when I moved to Los Angeles, I was working at a place called the Philosophical Research Society. And there was a woman named Pat Irvin, and she was tough, man. And she didn't like me. I could tell that she didn't like me, but she was real into like what she felt the angels told her, and she said, well, the angels told me, or whatever her phraseology was, that you should give lectures here if you want. I don't remember what it was, but something about Pat Urban. And they had people giving lectures on metaphysical things, uh, topics, and the place was founded um, by a man named Manley Hall. So I started giving these Saturday morning talks on A Course in Miracles. There would be like 10, 15 people there. But I was just so happy. And I was a temporary secretary during the week, and I just lived for these lectures. And I combed the book with, you know, fine-tooth combed, and I so prepared, and I remember what I wore in my first lecture. I, I couldn't tell you what I wore at any lecture in my entire career, but I could tell you what I wore that first lecture. And then she called me that afternoon and said, it's like it was yesterday, she called me that afternoon and said, would you like to do it every week? And I was just over the moon. The last thing I was thinking of was that you could make a, a living doing this because there wasn't a career doing this. Maybe you would ask if people gave, I think we asked for a suggested donation of $3. And um, I started giving these lectures. Now, I moved to Los Angeles in 1983. Before I moved from Houston to Los Angeles, I do remember having a phone call with a friend who said of a family member or a bro- either a family member or a close friend, something terrible and he's dying. And I said, what do you mean he's dying? He's like, young. He said, yeah, but there's this disease. There's this disease and they, 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 can't, they don't know what it is. And I'm going to say, well, doesn't he just need penicillin or something? No, it's this disease. And she was describing AIDS. And it was the first time I had heard of it. But it was just the very, very beginning. So I had already heard that there was this disease out there and it was killing people and they didn't have a cure for it. Well, I started lecturing in October of 1983. And within a few months, AIDS burst onto the scene. Because remember, I was living in Los Angeles. People have asked me if it was similar to COVID. COVID was very easy to get, but the chances were that you would survive. AIDS was very hard to get, but the chances were that you would not survive. And I was just giving these lectures about a God who loves you no matter what, and how when we love each other enough, miracles happen. And so gay men started coming more to my lectures. It's like I didn't even, and more and more people started coming. Because Western medicine, it's not like they weren't trying, because they were trying. 
uh, to come up with some treatment for this disease. And um, the religious institutions were like, had to get over their own homophobia or whatever it was, they were eerily silent. And so gay men in LA, in a very real way, gave me my career. And then we did things with that as the years went by. We started uh, places where we could have our support groups more for people with AIDS, and I became a real AIDS activist. But it was always along with the lectures. It was always tied to that. And then somebody suggested that I write a book, and then I did. I said, I don't know how to write a a book. People would say, you should write a book based on these lectures you give. And I remember saying, I don't feel pregnant with a book. And they'd say, well, it's in those tapes. And I said, I don't know how to get it out of the tapes onto a page. I'm not a writer. And then one night I was in San Francisco because I would lecture in LA two or three times a week and then I would travel to other cities. I mean, my, my schedule was, I flew a lot. And uh, there was a man named Dr. Jerry Jampolsky, who was one of the original speakers. He was a psychiatrist, very much a part of that early Course in Miracles arrival in the world. And we were eating dinner before my talk in San Francisco. And he said, um, you should write a book. I said, everybody tells me I should write a book, but I don't feel pregnant with a book. He said, it's in those tapes, because we had these little cassette tapes. He said, it's in the cassette, cassette tapes. I said, I know. I said, I don't know how to get it out of the cassette tapes to a page. And he said, let's just join in consciousness. Let's just join in consciousness right now that there is someone out there who would know how to help you get it from the tapes to the page. And that was a Thursday night in San Francisco. <clears throat> Two days later in LA on a Saturday morning, after my lecture there, a man came up to me, said he was a literary agent. I said, oh, this must, it must be meant to be. I told him. And he said he would call me. Now, this was the day, days before uh, phone message machines. I don't know if he ever called me. I feel sorry for the guy because he, he might have realized one day he sort of missed out. Or maybe he tried calling me. I don't know. But five days after that, I was giving a, so this is now a week to the day after the Thursday night in San Francisco, I'm, I gave a talk in New York City. At the end of my talk, there's a man standing there, and I looked at him. He was standing at the end of the line, and I looked at him, and I had a feeling I had destiny with him. And he introduced himself as Al Lohman. He said, I'm a literary agent. Have you thought about writing a book based on your talks? I said, everybody tells me to, but I don't feel pregnant with a book. He said, uh, it's in those little cassette tapes. I said, I don't know how to get it from the cassette tapes to the page. And he said, I can help you. And he was my agent, and he indeed put me together with a woman who helped me write a proposal. And then when, the, when I look back on it now, what happened was, in ways that surprised me at the time, and I think probably surprised him, there was a bit of an auction for the book, because the man who was head of Harper San Francisco at the time was a very well-known editor. When I think back on it, perhaps he himself was gay, because he um, then called New York and said, this is a phenomenon. All the gay guys in L.A. are coming to our lectures. All the gay guys in New York are coming to our lecture because there was this, you know, like I said, they gave me my career. It became a kind of hub of hope and even social life. You know, we all gather on Tuesday night type of thing. And then the support groups. It was serious. It was fun. It was loving. It was a very profound, profound thing going on. So the book took a long time to write because I was not a writer. My agent at the time said, not just a uh, return to love, he, said he called it a course in writing. Then when it came out, and it was late, but it came out, and Oprah Winfrey show, now she did not yet have her book club, but they were doing a show about a movie, I think it was called Crash, and there was something about miracles in it, mm -hmm. And then one of, they said, well, we need to get something as a hook for it. And she told me later that one of her producers said, well, a book came for you to read, for us to look at, for a show. It's called A Return to Love, Reflections on the Principles of A Course in Miracles. And then Oprah said, I'll take it home and I'll read it this weekend. And she loved it. And she had me on. And she said it was the best book she'd ever read, and she gave a thousand copies to her audience. So in a very real way, she gave me, you know, the gay community had given me this, uh, like a, a life to live with this, the work that we were all doing together. And then when Oprah 
announce the book that way. It became an instant bestseller and remained number one on the New York Times bestseller list for 35 weeks. And she really opened up the space of possibility for me as an author. And then I just continued with my work and um, continued to write books and continued to give lectures and continued to give classes and uh, started nonprofit organizations to help AIDS patients, Project Angel Food, which was a an organization we started to give meals on wheels, as it were, to homebound people with AIDS at the time, has now served 16 million meals. So these things have continued. Uh, I co-founded an organization uh, called the Peace Alliance. And I was always a an activist. I mean, I'd grown up in a home where political passions and beliefs were very important. Um, my father was an immigration lawyer, but I, I definitely felt you no know, my particular service and contribution in Dharma or whatever you want to call it has to do with teaching um, and coaching and the world of you know transformational internal change, spiritual change. Um, my parents would say, "We'll send you to rabbinical school." And I didn't. I didn't want to be clergy. I wanted to be what clergy is, but without the institutional especially since I talk about universal themes. So then at a point later in my life, I began to see a change in America. And my career had from the beginning taken me all over the place. And I had been, I had felt privileged and blessed to be allowed into people's lives in some of their darkest moments. The test results came back, and it's cancer. Your child is addicted to heroin. Someone you love has died. These things happen. But I began to see something around the year 2000 that was different. Just a sense America was losing its optimism. People were losing their sense of okayness. More and more people living with anxiety and tension and fear than there had seemed to be before. And I began to see how much of it was due to bad public policy. People couldn't get, <clears throat> you know, until the 1960s and 70s, there were ways to go to tuition-free public colleges and universities. All of a sudden, everything became hard. People didn't have health care. People, people were having to work at jobs that they hated just in order to have the health care benefits. People couldn't afford free, uh, child care. People didn't have paid family leave. People didn't, <clears throat> couldn't uh, afford to send their kids to college. And when I was a young woman in the 1970s, the average American worker had decent benefits and could afford a house and could afford a car and could afford a yearly vacation and could afford to send their kids to college. So I saw what has gone on here. And I then you know, did some math in my head. What went on here was the Reagan Revolution. What came on, what had happened, was that this was the, the flowering, the evil flowering, really, the dark spawn of trickle-down economics, this transfer of wealth into the hands of a very few Americans. And I began to realize that every year that neoliberal economic philosophy was baked into the cake. And I began to see how rigged the system had become. Now also remember, because I was working for Oprah Winfrey, who I think the world of, and if anyone is a righteous billionaire and deserves her success, it's Oprah. And I'm not saying that there's, that, that, that there, you know, that that's not possible, because it is. And the people that I met through her when her sort of world was opened up to me professionally, um, I met some absolutely wonderful people among that 0.001%. Not every rich person is a greedy bastard. There are nice people everywhere. This has nothing to do with person, you know, personal anything, but it has to do with systems. Because I was on one hand exposed to the fabulousness of the highest of the high in terms of how the super rich really live. And then I was exposed through my work to how the most disadvantaged in this society live, particularly when I went to uh, work uh, as a non-denominational minister at a church a blue collar church in uh, Metro Detroit, Michigan. And I went, oh my God. Because your kids aren't any smarter than your kids. You don't have any more divine potential than you have. But the system helps you. And you can fall and the system is forgiving and will pick you up. 
and you, there is no wiggle room for you. There is no real, we, we say there's a safety net, but it's, it's a system that just leaves so many people out. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse. You know, when I was in college, there were 300,000 people incarcerated in this country. Now they're 2.3 million. So I was just watching all this. I was just watching what was happening to this country, and I was watching the decline of the spirit of this country. You know, there was a time, you and I had a conversation a few minutes ago, and you were talking about your own country, and you said, when I was here a few years ago, I was proud every time my country was mentioned, and that, that was no longer true. And that's what happened to me. I grew up at a time when we were the hot, we were the cool, and we we're not the hot and we were not the cool. I don't mind that we're no longer hot and cool, but I mind the reasons why we're no longer hot and cool. And also, because I have traveled a lot internationally, I saw how many of the problems, you know, I've been raised, I first started to travel when I was a little girl, so it was post-World War II, Europe was just rising back up, so of course the United States was ahead in a lot of things. And I just watched it completely change. And I, 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 it was shocking to me. It was the European countries that had the health care and had the educational system and had the airports and had the trains and had they're like, whoa, and we were just, you could just see the decline in this country. And I, because of my work, would often know politicians. And I would also be involved in, in um, lobbying efforts through various nonprofits that I either was working for, I was a, a board member, or lobbying for, you know, an activist. And I was, you know, I was a Democrat, I was supporting Democrats, I was, um, yeah, you know, I was a voter, I would do fundraisers, I would do what I could. But I began to see something I didn't like. Um, I would say, you know, I really got to talk to you. These people really need health care. This is, this is not good. You really, these people need health care. And the politicians, even in my own party, would say, yeah, it's so true. We're working so hard. I thought, okay, they're going to work on it. And then five years later, I would just notice how things wouldn't fundamentally change. Five years later, yeah, we're, we got to work hard. Five years later, I would be told things like, well, why don't you start a super PAC? And you could raise a lot of money. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. This is, this is not good. Something's happened. And at that point, I thought, I'm going to run myself. And I ran for Congress. And then when I ran for president in 2020, I just knew in my heart I had things I wanted to say. And now in 2024, it was not the same, like, I'm going to run for president. It was a tough decision to make. Because I had been in the belly of this beast before. And it's not pretty what's in that belly of that beast. And uh, there's a viciousness and a corruption there that is dark. And there is what I call a political media industrial complex. The multi-billion dollar industry is what it's all become. And um, I knew from last time that if they don't want you in the conversation, they have ways of getting you out of that conversation. The smears, the lies, the character assassinations. And um, so, it, so I had to, um, I had to think long and hard about this because I knew it was running into a burning building. But I felt the image I got was that I would be filled with a kind of spiritual fire retardant. Now, someone told me, um, a young woman told me something that really has stayed with me. She said, you know, you know the most successful tightrope walkers are people who do not have a net. And I really relate to that. You just have to get on that tightrope and walk. And it's, you know, it's an emotional roller coaster. It's, um, you know, the erasure, the invisibilizing, the smears attacks, a hatred that comes at you, this irrational animus. But I'm saying something that I believe needs to be said. And as president, I would do something that I believe needs to be done. And people who think, oh, you've never served in office, 
listen, I've spent time in those rooms at the highest of the high. And I know what they, there's this Wizard of Oz aspect about the whole thing. You know, you know I, if anything, I want to pull down the curtain. And uh, the more I read, the more I read about great presidents, the more I thought, no, no, my ideas are more in line with the trajectory of great, the great historical movements in the United States. That system, and most of the people in it, not all of it, there's some wonderful people who are candidates and who are legislators all over the country. But they are, it's almost like they're locked within a system that itself is stuck and which itself has gone awry, which itself is out of alignment with the highest aspirations of, of the Declaration of Independence and the real ideals of the United States. Why? Because they're all under the thrall of these multi-billion dollar corporate interests. And those are their donors. And so the people are not the problem. The American people, we're no better or worse than people anywhere else. And you could see, you know, whether it has to do with universal health care, free college, on issue after issue, even guns, gun safety, the vast majority of Americans want, want you know, moderate things. They want, even gun owners want common sense gun safety laws. Uh, Republicans and Democrats want tuition-free college. Republicans and Democrats want universal health care. But the system is institutionally resistant to providing those things because those things do not provide the corporate profits for the corporate donors that keep all those people in their jobs. And it's sick, and it's corrupt, and it's wrong, and it has taken us six inches from the cliff. And I'm not the kind of woman who is going to be quiet about that. And no, I'm not making any money doing this. I'm losing. <laughs> A lot actually because uh, I have a career where as long as you don't mention politics I can do quite well and make a nice living um, and people like you um, so no this is not a grift it is um, me living my heart's calling to the best of my ability why do you think they aren't interested in politics what when it actually affects them very much. I think there has been a well-strategized effort to make people think that politics is the purview of some expert class. I'll leave it to them, the myth of the experts, the myth of a political class, which is the opposite of a democracy. You know, Thomas Jefferson said the only safe repository for power is the hands of the people, and we have allowed ourselves to give it up. Uh, the French say, if you don't do politics, politics will do you. And I think a lot of the people who have routinely said, I'm not into politics, are waking up to the fact that, well, politics has done me. Because it's political why there's so much forever pa uh, chemicals, PFAS in your water. It's political why there are whole sacrifice zones where people's children are getting asthma and horrible respiratory uh, illnesses besides that one because of the toxins being spewed into, spewed into the air. It is political that we have, we're ramping up fossil fuel extraction at the very time when we should be ramping it down and this could threaten literally the habitabil habitability of the planet. It's political whether or not we go into wars like Iraq. It's political whether or not we have universal health care. So I think a lot of people are beginning to awaken. And what they really mean by I'm not political is I'm not part of that vicious, corrupt, toxic system. I don't want any part of it. Most of them are liars. Most of them are just, you know, Know, and, and I understand there the people's feeling that way. <coughs> people who feel their vote doesn't make a difference. People who feel no matter what party they vote for, things don't fundamentally change for them. I understand all that. But I also understand that we have to wick each other up right now. Because the only thing that will change that system is the arousal of enough people that we override those forces. And the word politeia, you know, the root comes from of the people. You know, it was never supposed to be, you know, it's become a kind of corporate machinery. And people are just pawns. But they have a choice here. And it's so sad how many of them think, yeah, but what can you do? And I'm standing right here. Hello. It's quite frustrating.
And then the press has made them feel, well, you can't vote for her. You can't vote for her because, you know, she's not qualified. But their idea of qualified is someone qualified to perpetuate the system as it is. I feel what makes me qualified is that I'm qualified to disrupt it. That's the qualification needed today. Um, and then if that doesn't work, they paint whatever mischaracterization of you to make people think, oh, you couldn't listen to her. She's not a nice person, or she's crazy as crystals, or she's abusive, or... They, they know what they're doing. I mean, they're, they're, they're good PR uh, masters, and it's sad to see how many people fall for it. Those are all the, the, the um, machinations of misin misinformation and disinformation. It is. It's an interesting shifting landscape, however. We've seen lately that figures like, of course, Joe Rogan, even Tucker Carlson's departure from Fox News and his starting, his starting him his own thing up on Twitter, like combining even Russell Brand and all these <coughs> alternative outlets that are ranking up views that are almost higher than the, Absolutely. the main networks. So how Absolutely. do you think that that shift Well, um, yeah, the I mean, yes, if they were all having me on, uh, all that you mentioned had Bobby Kennedy on. Um, you know, uh, Russell Brand has had me on, but Joe Rogan has not had me on. Elon Musk has given Twitter spaces to Kennedy, has not been willing to have me on, even though he said I'll have you know, any presidential candidate. Uh, so a lot of those independent outlets um, have chosen to erase me as much as um, some of the mainstreams have. I haven't quite figured it out. It's some irrational animus, it's misogyny, you know, and I'm not saying that I don't have my own, in The Course in Miracles it says, you take a very, you pay a very high price for not taking 100% responsibility for your own experience. Um, and the price you pay is that you can't change it. So I'm seeking to do whatever inner work, well, did you ever raise your voice? Yeah, I did, and I shouldn't have done that, and I'm so sorry that that person feels just felt disrespected, and I want to speak in a kind of way. But the stuff that's reported is just so over the top, it's ridiculous. And uh, I was reading an article today about Joe Biden's uh, temper, and of course it's all in the context of making it very understandable. People weren't doing their jobs. and. Um, very protected, you know, the article protects him from any, you know. How do you gather your strength? I'm a meditator. I, my spiritual connection is everything. It's why I'm doing this. And until I feel in my heart that something is telling me give it up and stop, then my only option is to give it all I have. And you know, The Course in Miracles says, love is real, nothing else really deeply, ultimately exists. And this is the highest spiritual challenge I've ever had. We have a corporate aristocracy in this country. Universal, uh, excuse me, uh, insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, food companies, chem com chemical companies. Uh, agricultural companies, gun manufacturers, uh, big oil, and defense contractors. And there's a difference between righteous profit, which I'm all for, and profiteering. And in too many cases, in too many ways, those people profiteer. They serve their own short-term uh, profit maximization goals before any ethical consideration or moral consideration, in some cases even legal consideration, uh, for the health and safety and well-being of the American people. And the president should be the advocate for the people. The president should not be serving a dual function. Um, and a lot of people who run some of those uh, industries, we'd have a nice dinner perhaps, but they'd know unequivocally whose side I was on. And they would come at me vehemently the way they came at uh, Franklin Roosevelt. They called him a socialist, and they'd call me a socialist. And the difference between me and every other uh, modern president, but what makes me similar to Roosevelt, is I would say what he said. I welcome their hatred. That would be my presidency. And you have no personal fear of getting assassinated, anything? Well, 
I think that uh, I'm not naive about how America operates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One world is falling apart. An old institutional order of things is crumbling in front of our eyes. This is a time of profound phase transition. And the masters of the old are trying to keep the lid on the impulse of new beginnings because they find that threatening, because it is threatening the old order. But that old order is passing away. It will either pass away through wisdom or it will pass away through chaos. So simultaneously to that sense of decline and devolution is this evolutionary impulse. They're happening simultaneously of a new world that is so clearly struggling to be born. You see the kids out, the environmental protests all over the world. You see uh, everything, uh, people trying to bring forth something more beautiful, something more true. And you really see this in young people whose souls are crying out for it, and who have such a, such a realization that the world is not what it should be. Um, at this point, I think we're called to be both death doulas and birth doulas. We're called to be people capable of helping the old die a just and gentle death that harms no one and to proactively give birth to what is possible. In order to do that, I do believe we have to do what you just said because Everything you do is infused with the consciousness with which you do it. It's like the Einstein line that uh, the problems of the world will not be solved from the level of thinking we were at when we created them. So we're all at the effect, in the ways that you said, we're all at the effect of the tablets, we're all at the effect in young people's minds and the, everybody, nobody has any impulse control and everybody's texting and wishing that they had never texted it and all of those things. And as Martin Luther King said, we need quantitative changes in our circumstances and qualitative shifts in our souls. Now you said countries don't prioritize that. Some do, Tibet does, you know, some of the, there are countries that do, but in Western Europe and America, we certainly don't. But there are individuals and cultural movements in your country, in my country, all over the world of an awakening. The 21st century consciousness is in mindset is different than the 20th. The 20th century mindset in the West, very mechanistic. The world is a big machine, it's a kind of Newtonian model, and if you don't like what's happening in the world, you just tweak pieces of the machine. That's passing away, because it clearly didn't solve all our problems. That very mechanistic way of looking at the world created and exacerbated some of our problems. The 21st century is far more whole person, far, far more holistic, uh, there is a British physicist named James Jeans who said that it turns out the world is not one big machine, it's one big thought. So now the primacy of consciousness and the way that you described, finding your own center, finding that spiritual sweet spot. Once you realize, which is very different than the mechanistic paradigm of the 20th century, that consciousness is primary, that consciousness is the level of cause and everything that happens out there is the level of effect, then you realize attending to your inner life is absolutely essential if we are to make the kinds of inner external changes that are needed. I think more people are willing to hear that, yearning to hear that, than we know. The problem is not the people. The problem is this behemoth of soulless corporate power married to governmental authority in a way that is a, an oppressive and suppressive element, and in a way that retains the good, we need to smash it. Peacefully, non-violently, but no little tweak here or tweak there is gonna fix this. This has become a system of oppression and tyranny. So if you're in the top 20% of Americans, the economy's good for you, and, and that's good. The problem isn't that people can get rich here. The problem is that not nearly enough people ever have a chance. So many people are locked out. So many people are locked out even before they're 10 years old. And as president, I would seek to uh, initiate a season of repair, a new economic beginning that allowed America to realign itself with the sense that all men are created equal and everyone should get a fair shot. How would you address those kinds of corporate... Well, first of all, I would not be appointing them to positions of power. And I think some of the people I would want to appoint may or may not get confirmed by the Senate 
get, depending on who is in charge of the Senate. I realize that. And I would also be able to use the bully pulpit to talk about what's really happening. And I would be able to use executive orders. There's a lot the president does do. The president can unilaterally, for instance, cancel the Willow Project despite what big oil wants. Now, if you're a president, you're planning to run again, and it's all about protecting the power that's there, you go, well, I better not do that. But for me, it's like, no, that's why I'm here to do that. And I think that this would be a moment of awakening. I think I, I don't think of my presidency as a two-term thing. I don't think it's supposed to be a two-term, because uh, there's a radicalism uh, you know, in, in the best sense of the word, and I think America is a radical idea that cannot be um, undercut, should not be undercut by, oh, if I want to run again. No, 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 no. I want to make these changes and then say to whoever's still there, try taking this away from people, see how they're going to feel about that. Um, and, and then you turn it over to someone younger, and I will have helped give a kind of chiropractic alignment. I was saying to someone the other day, I want to help America, the government, get its heart back, and in a way, people get their spine back. Well, there are so many people who know what to do to repair this country, who know what to do about agriculture, who know what to do about energy, who know what to do about repairing people's lives, who know what to do about health. But the people with solutions don't have the power. And the people with power don't really all the time want to hear the people with solutions because they don't necessarily uh, create corporate profits for their donors. It is that crazy. And I, my job, as I see it, would be to connect power to the problem solvers. Well spoken, yeah, definitely, definitely. But you also have some interesting initiatives yourselves, yourself with the Department of Children and Youth. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've heard the that before. There are many ways in which the children of the United States are in crisis. Once again, not the children of the most financially advantaged people, they're doing fine. Um, but millions and millions of American children live lives in crisis and are in situations where by the time they're 10 years old, their chances of incarceration are higher than their chances of high school graduation. So I want to see a massive transfer of focus and resources into the lives of children at a very young age. We have children who are traumatized by the time they go to preschool. I've had elementary school uh, principals in this country tell me that they had elementary school students on suicide watch. So uh, that's why I want a Department of Children and Youth. We are agencies that they now exist are completely overwhelmed. They can't take on. Uh, they're just part of another agency, uh, Health and Family Services. So that I want, and I also want a Department of Peace um, so that we get about the work of proactively waging peace in our time. What are some ways of, of, of doing Well, there are four, uh, there are four uh, factors which are statistically proven to indicate a higher incidence of peace and a lower incidence of violence. These are the factors of peace building. Number one, uh, greater economic opportunities for women. Number two, greater educational opportunities for children. Number three, the reduction of violence against women. And number four, the amelioration of unnecessary human despair. War is to peace what sickness is to health. War is simply the absence of peace. Peace is not the absence of war. And that's why we need to proactively cultivate, through humanitarian action, through diplomatic action, the conditions of peace. How would you pay for those things without making all my earning money go away to the government? Well, none of this needs uh, addition to middle class taxes of any fundamental weight whatsoever. Uh, what you have in the United States today is people who are very, very wealthy who pay less taxes relatively to people who are making much more, much less money than they are. We are paying billions of dollars in corporate subsidies to companies that are already making billions of dollars in profits. In 2017, there was a $2 trillion tax cut. 83 cents of every dollar went to the highest earners and the richest corporations. That should be repealed. The middle class tax cut part of it was very good and should be put back. Even among the middle class, though, if I say to you, you're going to pay $10 more, but you're going to save $100 in health care costs, you still come out ahead. So it's, it's not about higher taxes, it's about what your tax money is going for. Also, there should be a reduction of the Pentagon budget, and also there should be a uh, wealth tax where people who are, make $50 million and more 
uh, pay an extra 2%. People who make a billion in assets should pay an extra 1%. Uh, President Biden had wanted to hire more um, uh, IRS agents in order to catch those who are very, very wealthy, who are using all these illegal uh, means to get out of their taxes. And of course, the Republicans didn't want that to happen, wants to protect them. So we just, as soon as we stop protecting the ultra-rich, uh, from their having to pay their fair share. There's going to be a lot more money for the comp to spend uh, on the common good. Mm. Yeah, I think I would be uh, the most honest and transparent president that we've seen in a very, very long time. Yeah, I think people would be amazed what I come out and say. But I think that that's true even of the campaign. I'm not saying anything everybody doesn't know. I'm just saying it when the mic is on. It's like, oh, she actually said it. Do you believe she said that? Yeah. We need a president who just says what we all already know. And I feel that Bonnie, uh, Bernie Sanders said it and says it. And that's what they loved about Bernie. How would you say that you differ from Bernie? Well, I'm a woman. And he's a man. And I'm, he's someone who's been in politics all his life. And I come from the world of spirituality and personal transformation. But in terms of our commitment to social justice, we, we're, we're branches of the same tree. We both come from that Eastern European Jewish stock, you know, um, politically. He reminds me in many ways of my father, the family I grew up in, yeah. I don't know what the best advice I've ever gotten, but I know the best advice I give myself. Number one, relax, and number two, get over yourself. So it's not that other people have said it to me so much as I know that I'm served when I say it to myself. Get over yourself, Marianne, this is not about you.